A while ago, I said this. We are looking for topics that you would like to see in the Things You Now Know series. This could be anything. It could be something general, like how does a steam engine work, to something really, really oddly specific, like how does a hydrostatic lubricator lubricate the cylinders? Very specific, that one, I shall admit. And surprisingly, some of you guys came back saying yes. Now, I'm a man of my word, and we are going to do an episode on it. And if you're sitting there thinking, this is not for me, I, I don't know what he's on about, when, even when he says the word hydrostat. Do not worry, that's exactly what these episodes are for, so stay with me, and I'll guide you through the process. So, how does a hydrostatic lubricator lubricate the cylinders, and the rest? In the morning, while a fireman is raising steam, it is the driver's responsibility to oil up the locomotive. Now, I need to say something that sounds obvious, but is important. Oil floats on water. Remember that, oil floats on water. And this can either be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on the exact circumstance. Everything on a steam locomotive that moves needs some sort of lubrication to prevent friction. If we think about it, in the winter we rub our hands together to warm them up because we're generating friction which is generating heat. And the same thing happens on a locomotive on a slightly bigger scale with potentially more disastrous consequences. It's not unheard of for an axle box to catch fire, although thankfully uh, not here. Now it may sound contradictory that uh, a locomotive designed off the basic principle of generating steam by heating water can itself overheat, but believe me, it's a thing. When you're next down and your train has a long layover, let's say on this current timetable, most likely at Ropley, you may see the driver walking around the locomotive, touching the back of his hands to various parts of the engine. What he's doing is checking the temperature of the bearings and axle boxes to see if they're overheating and getting too hot. Now we're quite fortunate, but express locomotives never really had this option because the whole definition of an express was you don't stop. So what do you do? Well, they came up with a clever idea of incorporating a capsule of aniseed or garlic oil into the motion and bearing. So if the bearing got too hot, the oil would be released, emitting a strong warning smell to the driver who would take appropriate actions. Mallard famously had one of these installed on the middle inside big end, which is one of the cranks that drive the wheels. During her world record run, where she attained a speed of 126.4 miles an hour, the big end did get too hot and that oil was released, meaning the bearing was overheating. The driver slowed the locomotive down and ran at reduced speed to Peterborough, where the locomotive was taken off and run to Doncaster for repairs. Interestingly, the marketing department had already foreseen this potential eventuality. So what they did was take a lot of pictures of the locomotive before the run, just in case Mallard didn't actually make it back to King's Cross. The replacement locomotive was reportedly only just in sight at King's Cross when the head of publicity handed out the photos. Crafty devils. Anyway, checks like this actually still occur on the national network now without you even realising it. Along the main line, there are devices called hot axle box detectors, which essentially, as your train go goes over the top, it measures the temperature on each axle. And if one is significantly higher than the rest, then it will send an alarm to the signalman, who will then take appropriate actions. You can even get more modern units that actually have them built in, which is even better. So where does oil come into all of this? Well, to prevent any of that happening, we use oil as a lubricant, which prevents friction, which in turn prevents those bearings from heating up and causing serious damage. More modern locomotives started using grease because it lasted longer, which reduced labour times and made it more economical and efficient. This can be said for pretty much everything on the main line at the moment. All of our locomotives need to be oiled every day, some more than others, depending on how modern they are and also how many moving parts they have. Now, to make things even more confusing, you can actually get different types of oil for a steam locomotive in the same way you can get different types of oil for your car. These are broken down into two main forms, lubrication oil and steam oil. Steam oil is used for anything that comes in contact with steam because when you heat it up, it becomes really, really runny. Lubrication oil is used for pretty much everything else. There are a few ways to get oil to the right place, all of which takes place in the morning while the locomotive is being prepared. 
you may be familiar with the sight of a driver walking around with an oil can in hand, filling up oil pots and sticking a cork in it when he's done. Those are the bearings and motion elements. And those are on the outside. However, there are some bits on the inside which still need attention. So the driver has to clamber up inside and get those oil pots as well. Or some realize that um, when your fireman has finished lighting the fire, they suddenly have some free time aside from cleaning. So occasionally they get given an extra job. As well as lighting the fire and getting the engine nice and warm, the driver also needs to oil up. Sounds easy enough. The only downer is there's 124 oiling points on this engine and not all of them are on the outside. That was taken um, a few years ago when uh, Lord Nelson was running. I did not expect to see the light of day, but there you are. Lord Nelson looks quite spacious on the inside. I can assure you it is anything but. The axle boxes also need to be inspected daily without exception. But remember when I said oil floats and water? Well, this is now a bad thing because the first thing is water is abrasive. If you think about cliffs that have been eroded away, rivers being cut due to water power alone, you suddenly realise it's not the thing you really want on a precisely machined crucial metal component, or like a bearing. So what do you do for when you're filling up an oil pot, you'll see oil on the top because oil floats in water. So how do you get the water out while leaving the oil in? You use one of these. This is called an oil syringe. It's uh, essentially a syringe uh, which is designed for oil. And it works simply like this. We have a pot here where we've got oil on the top so if we're looking down we just see oil. Underneath we can clearly see it's water. Using the syringe we can just go straight in, start sucking out that water, which we then place in another container. And there you are, problem solved. Now this needs to be done on a pit, ideally, and um, we're finding out at the moment that not having a pit is making life a bit more challenging and interesting. However, it's not practical to, have it, to keep having to stop to top up the oil pots, so what do you do on the run? You use one of these. This is called a mechanical lubricator. It's a clever device that feeds oil to the cylinders or motion depending on what's required. The way it works is by harnessing the movement of a locomotive. The rod down here is connected to the motion. That in turn turns the wheel, which is on a ratchet, meaning it can only turn in one direction. Inside here is the oil bath, and that has lots of little pumps, one for each little pipe. If they're trimmed in such a way that they'll send a precise amount of oil down that pipe for every full rotation that wheel does. Once in the pipe, there's an on-return valve to stop the oil shuttling backs and forwards and to push it all the way down to where it's supposed to be feeding. You didn't intend to find these on shunting locomotives because first of all they were never really too far away from the pit, they weren't going quickly so the risk of overheating was pretty minimal. You can also get mechanical lubricators for steam oil, but steam oil, when it gets cold, it's really viscous and gloopy, which is not ideal. So what they occasionally do is have an extra coil that goes through the lubricator bottom and back out again, just carrying steam to warm it up and make it more usable and workable. Um, you can actually get uh, locomotives with both on. So 506 has both a mechanical lubricator and a hydrostat, which is an unusual combination, but does work rather nicely. And now for the moment you've all been waiting for. Here is a hydrostatic lubricator. These are designed exclusively to feed steam oil into the cylinders and any steam touching parts where they're set up to, so you can get them feeding into the steam chest as well. There are a few different variations because different companies made them, but they all work on the same basic principle. Steam is fed in from the boiler at the top. It then goes through a condenser, condensing that steam into water, which then flows down to the bottom. Oil is filled up here, or on other ones you can get them filled up in a front cap at the front. That oil is then being heated up, that steam oil is turning from thick to really runny and perfect for what we need. At the bottom we have oil feed valves which we trim. Now remember when I said oil floats on water, now this is a good time for that. Because what happens 
the water gets underneath the oil and starts pushing it up, trying to lift that oil up in the air. We can then adjust the flow. We then see the oil in the sight glasses here. And what we're doing is watching the droplets and we're aiming to have about two to three drops a minute going to those cylinders. We have one for each side, one for each cylinder. When the oil gets to the top and goes out of sight of that sight glass, it is then atomized or mixed with steam and then sent to the cylinders and sprayed there in the form of a fine mist. Now inside the sight glasses is water, that same condensed water from steam. Just a little bit is siphoned off because oil floats in water, so when it goes into the sight glass, it will rise up in the air. So why is this such a big deal? Well, if oil stopped going to the cylinders mid-journey, potentially they could seize up and put the engine into self-destruct mode, which is um, unsurprisingly not too good. That could cost tens of thousands of pounds to fix. Same happens with the axle boxes where they lose too much oil or get waterlogged. That's another 10 grand on top of that. Now, believe it or not, there's a thing as putting too much oil into something where you can get a carbon buildup, better known as oil burn. So it really is a fine balancing act, which all our drivers are trained for. But for now, I think that's enough. Thank you so much for watching, guys. I'd like to say my thanks to uh, Mark Drinkwater, who's one of the Vopley team here, who you did actually see in the last video making a cheeky cameo. A while longer. That system is still in use today, and here's what it looks like. But he's one of the many guys here at Robley who are incredibly knowledgeable. Thank you so much for watching, guys. As always, if you'd like to support the Watercrest line, visit watercrestline.co.uk forward slash support or to donate £10 via text, text Watercrest to 70085. Failing that, come down and visit us. It's £40 for a family ticket and you can book your own compartment or table and have a wonderful day out here at the railway. And we look forward to seeing you. But for now, Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time for another episode of Things You Now Know.